if you have a web service, how would you even get data to, to the user and how would they you know, deal with it? So what I've done in, in my career is that I would build a web service and that web service, as we were just discussing, could live in Flask, I think would be a good choice. Let's just say Flask. And then all you need to do is deploy it on someplace. So it, you could deploy it on any of the cloud platforms. We, we already just talked about that, right? You could deploy it on GCP via App Engine. We'll just say GCP AE. We could deploy it on um, the Azure via the, uh, the app services. And then we also could deploy it on the Beanstalk via AWS. Right, so these are these are great ways to do it, and so yeah, you may be asking, well, okay, that's great, I deployed this, but <coughs> how do I actually get input from the user? Well, the way that you would do this would be that you would add a post method, and the HTTP. So this is a HTTP web service here, and an HTTP web service. Uh, has several verbs associated with it. And a verb is like basically an action that you can perform on a specific route. So if you go to uh, a web page, you're either going to do typically the most common are going to be get and also post, right? These are these are two of the most common verbs. And a get means that you're just going to receive data. Uh, and a um, post means you're going to send the data to the web service. And so all you need to do to get user input from a user is put a, a route inside of Flask that says, let's say input, we could even literally call it input. So it could be, for example, you know, uh, example.com slash input so let's say we created that now that input because we told it it only can accept the post methods the user would be uh be be posting that content into that web service and th this could go into two phases so the first phase would be here we could treat this as the computer first has access to this. And what I mean by this is that when you do this kind of stuff with like a web service, really what you're doing is you're building something so that a computer can can interact with your your, your example, right? So you're you're telling the computer itself that you're going to take a specific type of JSON payload and this JSON payload could have I don't know, um, an image, right? And so we, we could we could say image here, and then it could be, um, you know, file dot, dot PNG, right? Now, the the web service itself is like great. I got this. I got this image, and then it, you can pass that image into whatever it is you're doing, like you know, image recognition. But unfortunately. The, the 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 human here doesn't like that right so so if i if i build a web service the the human doesn't know the typical human doesn't know how to call a web service and and put json payloads inside because you have to post this data using this uh, web service method so what people do instead is is what what you're what several of you have been talking about, which is you have to build an application that interfaces with the back end. And so that application could be either a web a web page or it could be mobile. And so in either case, all they would do is wrap up that input. In fact, I've worked at companies, I built a company from scratch that was a sports social network where we had web applications and we had mobile applications and this is exactly what they did. They would call into a web service and they would have a form that would accept, they would prompt the user for the data 
and, and then the user would um, put the input inside of that form and then that form data would go into the web service and then it would do its work and then give back the results. So, so this is, I think that the, the delineation is that you need to have the Flask service plus later, if you want a human to interact with it, you need some kind of a, a application. And it would be like the ones we just discussed, the single page web app or iOS or Android. Th does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sure. So so again, this is my recommendation is that is that using that that scenario of of you you could literally build an entire company by first building the back end and and having all these URLs before you even build the 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 GUI. And I think it's actually much better to do that. Now, if you're working with business people, a lot of times they, they will force you to do this, which is very dangerous actually, is they, they get really excited about, you know, if somebody hires you to build a company for them, they'll say, oh, build, build this website, build this mobile app. They have no idea what they're talking about because all they care about is, is the make it pretty part, right? And this is the, <laughs> unfortunately, this is like painting the walls. And, and of course it's important to paint the walls, but, if you paint the walls in the wrong order, you're in big trouble because you'll have to rip the wall down again or do some plumbing or put pipes in. So I think it's much better to, to be really focused on knowing what it is that your application will do and then calling those endpoints. And a lot of times, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's a service called um, uh, Postman. That's actually a very good service that will help you um, organize your your steps and so if you were again kind of building like an e-commerce company or a sports social network or you know um, a recommendation engine or whatever it is you're building and you're doing this step by step you could use something like postman and i think i still have an account here uh let me just log in real quick and, and what you do is you could collect all of these endpoints and, and actually um you know, like for example, this is some project I was working on a, a, a long time ago, where I would do curls to these these applications here, and, and then basically I'm doing what a front end would do, but I don't need to write the front end, right? And then you could collect a bunch of these these um, actions. So, so I would say my advice, if you're building something and you really do care about building a production application and you want it to be a software as a service application, is I would use this first. And, and and use this to instrument, right? Because you can you can actually you know go through here and say like you know new API that I developed and say this is a new service I'm developing, <clears throat> and then um, you could say add a collection, or actually I think you say or create a collection. Okay, so and then it opens up. Uh, well, anyway, I won't. I won't. I don't want to get into too much of the weeds here. But basically, in in a nutshell, it will. You can't see this because it opened up another page and it's another app. But basically, you can start to put in um, routes and then collect them and call them in, inside of Postman. So I think something like Postman would be better than building a front end or a mobile app at first because again it's the make it work phase and just make sure you can exercise it once you you've got it solid and you have a flask app deployed somewhere and you can put post methods to it you can send it data it can do predictions then then the only other thing you need to do is think about okay what so let, let's even do this let's do this let's say you're going to build a, a machine learning company for, from scratch so how, how would you do this what, what would you what was what would be the minimum amount of stuff you need to build you could probably build something with a Flask app. So, so let's even call this, let's say Flask um, ML backend, like a real backend. So what, what would be the endpoints you would need to build? I would say you would first, you would need to have an authentication endpoint. So this endpoint would make sure that someone has an account and, and that could go to, let's say Cognito or it could go to Firebase or, or whatever 
cog cognito. There we go. A AWS Cognito. So it can authenticate. Make sure you have an account. Okay, great. It lets you in. You would also maybe have an auth in endpoint here as well, or auth authorization endpoint. Authorization. And, and so this one would say also with Cognito um, is it would tell you, you know, what what resources you can access. Like um, so, this would be I don't know like admin right you could say okay the admin can access everything and then I would build like a predict uh, endpoint and so this predict endpoint what it could do is it could accept let's just take the handwriting right it takes images it accepts images and it predicts inside of the image it returns back uh, to the user or, or return back a payload that says the um, the digit name, right? So it could be like name uh, one, right? And, and and that's pretty much, I don't know, maybe log out, something like this. So, so you could build out just like four endpoints here and you have this backend and, and you could build out this 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 prediction backend service so you can, people can sign up. Well, I guess you'd maybe do the register, right? So you have another endpoint that's register. So it could be, you know, again with Cognito, register so okay i want to register for your service that predicts my handwriting i want to authenticate once i've registered uh, now I'm a, I'm a registered user okay what can i access oh great i can access the predict route and then you do it you do the prediction and then um you log out that could be a very very simple um you know back end for production service and then once you've got that set up i would say phase so this is step one then i would say step two would be that i would use postman first i would not build a web service i would not build the single page web app or flask app my, my personal advice do not do that do do something like postman make sure does it work right like can i actually call it um and also implicit to this step one here is I'll just put that we're doing continuous delivery, right? So we already talked about how important this is, is that every time you're, you're, you're doing the code, it automatically tests, it all, you know, lints the code, tests it. This is what I would focus on, which, which is a little bit of work. Um, I would make sure that this works. If you can do this, then step three would be, okay, you got the web service working. Now you can finally build the front end. And then the front end would be whatever you want. In fact, maybe even you don't care uh, about um, you know the web even some some companies don't do this i think wechat right is like like a, every time i use wechat it doesn't even let me do anything on the web you, you they just do mobile first like maybe you just do mobile right and and you just go mobile first or, or whatever you but whatever it is you want to do then the mobile or the web would call into step 2 does that make sense I believe this is how most, if you're starting, if you're, if you're a founder of a company, this is what I've done. And most companies, I've built dozens of new products. This is how I did it. Is anything confusing about any of this stuff? The procedures you just introduced uh, doesn't cover uh, elasticity, which is a necessary part of our project, I believe. Mm -hmm. if, uh, I think no matter what um, platform we use, uh, in the end, we still need to um, incorporate uh, elasticity into our uh, web app or web services so that the only um the the only service i could think of is like cloudwatch uh that sort of stuff so how can we um yeah. no it's, yeah so that's a good question so so this does implicitly um i guess what i what i should have mentioned here is that 
this is the cloud, right? This is running, so, and it could be anywhere in the cloud. It could be on any of the cloud platforms I talk about. Let's take one that's very easy, which is Google App Engine. So GAE, it is, is automatically scales. <laughs> so, so if you deploy a web app that's a, that's a platform as a service web app like Google App Engine, the more requests you have, it'll automatically scale up and down. So you don't even have to worry about it. So, so that's one way you could handle it. The second, same goes with um, the uh, Beanstalk. So if you did Beanstalk here, that's one of the features as well with Beanstalk is that um, Beanstalk will elastically scale up and down as well automatically. Same goes for the um, Azure App Services is um, Azure App Services also will um, elastically scale up and down and so this is one of the advantages or, or or you could even not even do flask you could just go even lower level and do the um, lambda aws lambda and that also scales up and down so if you use a pass which is platform as a service you don't have to manage anything you don't have to manage servers you don't have to manage the vms and make them go up and down uh, personally that's what i would probably do is i would focus on a plat a pass based approach it, because it would the elasticity would be handled for me automatically. Oh, uh, I see. Okay. No, no, you can. No, I mean, you absolutely can do this. Like, like you know, we we know that like SageMaker has elasticity, and you know that uh, EC2 spot instances you can manage them. But it, it, a lot of it is what abstraction are you working at? And, and this this goes in again back into the into the I A A S. P A A S or serverless is that I, I have spent a lot of my life on um, doing doing stuff with with this, and I really don't want to do it anymore <laughs> because I, I did it and, and it's a lot of work. And this is much easier is platform as a service and serverless because as long as you do build. The, the service out on one of these platforms, it'll auto scale up and down. And now behind the scenes, they're doing all this, right? Behind the scenes, they have Kubernetes running or they have some scalability running and, and doing this. So, so for, for web services in particular, I think, especially for something like Python, I think either platform as a service or serverless is the way to go. Like, it, unless you're a deep expert I would not get into this. And even if you are a deep expert, which I am, I, I still go, why? why? Why would you manage the virtual machines yourself? If you have to do it, you have to do it. But a, a lot of times, most things that you would want to do, I don't think need need this. And even SageMaker. Like, so if you wanted to just, instead of even using Flask, because we know SageMaker has endpoints that you can actually deploy a model and the endpoint will auto scale up and down. You don't even need Flask. It'll just give you a web service. Same with um, Azure, Azure. Same and same with with um, AI platform on Google. All of them have web services that scale up and down for you. So I, I think that's probably the best way to use the cloud is avoid designing the scaling yourself if possible. That would not be my first choice. It's good to be aware. It's good to be aware. It's, I mean, it's good to be aware of it. I mean, it's, it's good to know that, but, but, and this is, but this is where the old days when people would build stuff, they would spin up a virtual machine, put a cluster, put a load balancer on front. The downside of that is you have to manage it. And, and, and I've, I've actually managed servers where I had a cluster of machines and there's, we get like 10 million users in, in like an hour. I've, I've had that happen before. And it's not fun because even if you set it up right, like it, it, it like takes a little bit of time and like you got to monitor it and maintain it. It's like, why? <laughs> like the cloud provider in the all these platform of services, they do it all for you. And, and so my opinion is, is just let them do it and focus on the business problem more. If you have to do it for some reason, like you have really specialized needs that for some reason don't work on a higher level platform like Google App Engine or Elastic Beanstalk or Azure App Services, okay, you got to do it. But I would not go first for that choice, my opinion. Yeah, awesome. I got it. Now, you can even test this out, right? So this is one of the things that that does 
and, and I think it's worth because of some of the um, yeah go ahead yeah in, 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 uh, keep, we don't that. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know if you're breaking up or I, yeah, I don't I didn't hear your question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, what I mean is uh, if um if we don't need to worry about that, so what's the point? Oh sorry, I think you're breaking up. Let let me I I, I think I can guess what you're going to ask. But 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 let me let me let me just get into this a little bit. So so here here, um, one way to think about a a professional. Let's just talk about a professional. Is that that you? What you do is you build a service that. Oh, okay, no problem. But but I think I know what your question is. So so if you're building a, a professional web service. You, you need to have a checklist and and the checklist would be that um, is it automated right so do you have an automatic deployment process and we we have gone into that automatic deployment that that's that's a must have for professional uh, cloud development also do you have some testing and linting and we got into that how how powerful that is right that's that's very important we also in the checklist want to make sure that that it's elastic right and so that's that's one of the things and and, and even as well adding some monitoring you know and, and logging uh, as well so so for example what happens if it's having problems how do you know it has problems right so these are these are just some of the things that you would do in a professional web service and so even if you are doing like a, a pass, right? And, and in the pass, you you have one of these like Google App Engine, you have um, Azure App Services, um, or or you have Beanstalk. Beanstalk, still, it's you're you're the professional. You can't guess. Like you have to verify that the the thing is elastic. And so, what I would recommend would be this workflow, which is you have. So, so basically, this is under um, elastic. We say, don't guess. Always check. That's how you get yourself into trouble. <laughs> and so, what we do, we would have GitHub, and inside of here. The, the human is checking the code in, and then we know that we can auto deploy to the cloud, right? Great. But, and when we do the auto deploy, we also maybe do some great stuff in here, right? We, we go through and we, we lint the code and we test it and we do some fun stuff here. But here's where the, the next level is, is that I would use, once it's been deployed, I would actually trigger maybe even like a nightly test uh, using either, there's two services that I've used. One is called Loader uh, IO, and I'll show you this right now. And the other is called Locus. And, and why would you do this? Is because anything could happen even if you are using the platform as a service tool that can like scale up and scale down, why guess, right? Don't, don't guess. If you're constantly making changes, it's, it's the same reason like why have a smoke detector in your house? Like you can just say, oh yeah, it'll, it'll, I already checked my house. It, it, there's no problems with it. Well, if, if you want to live, <laughs> you have a, a smoke detector, right? Because you, you, do, you don't want to assume that what happened today will be what happened in the future. So instead, if you have a nightly test that runs at midnight in, in let's say a staging environment right here, let, let's say this is the staging branch, 
you can you can not just guess that your 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 app is performing correctly, but you can verify it by doing a nightly load test. And so even I would say you're just making it easier because it probably will be very successful, but don't guess, right? And so if you have monitoring and logging with like AWS CloudWatch and you know that kind of things inside of here, you can. I'll show you what I've done two two different ways. I think I even have an application that I could show you for this too. So if we go to here's a example, Flask Locus. This would be good a good example. I think uh, of some things that um, that you could take a look at, but basically, just there's a walkthrough that goes goes through here. But but you you could just add a, a very simple test that just makes sure it doesn't work, right? Like does it work? Be, because this is a functional test where the deployment process that does linting and testing could be testing the business logic, but this tests a higher level. And why not? Why not have it automatically at night? Go through and do a load test. The other one that I've used as well is a Loader IO, and I actually really like this one, this simple cloud-based load testing, because what it does is you just sign in, and I think I even have an account here still, and um, I don't know if I have an account. Let's let's see. I, I, maybe I don't have an account anymore. But ba basically, the the um, the way it lo works is that you let me see if there's a picture of it here but basically you can just tell it to do a bunch of requests and it will it will do here we go getting started they'll have a picture here somewhere i think um creating a test here we go so yeah here we go here, here's a picture of it so you would just add a test in like this so it looks kind of like the postman and again, you could tell it to run at night and you do a request. And then basically once it does the request, it, it will it will actually scale up and, and it will scale up to, um, you know, it'll show you a chart that shows you how much traffic your application uh, can actually handle. Uh, and, you know, here we go. Can I schedule a load test? Yeah, you can. Anyway, this web service itself you could you could use, and it could it could do something very similar to what I was showing you earlier with um, the the flask the, this this um, locust thing. It, it does the same. It basically does the same thing. It spins up a bunch of of requests and and and, and tests your application. So I think it's it, it's not an either or. Like just because you're building on a service that has great elasticity still you need to verify it my my advice would be you you have a nightly test in a staging environment and, and you always know what the performance cap capabilities are of your application does that make sense hopefully yes okay yeah <clears throat> yeah so hopefully that answered the question about you know the the, the some of the stuff around building a, a back end and and how to do it and but but in, in a nutshell I, that's what i would focus on is is automating 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 the deployment and then also automating the verification right by using either loader io or or locus to to test it out and then if you if you do that you're in incredibly good shape to do the final step which is paint the house or make it make it look make it look good so the there, there were a couple of the things that that you guys asked about that i also can cover and those were the um, so, so so kind of on the same theme here is if, if you think about what are the core components of a of a cloud application and, and how do you take advantage of the cloud? So so one of them we talked about is this this pass service, right? And 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 we know that it's great because it it, it simplifies operations uh, simplifies ops so that's one thing that that's really handy about plat pass but another one is we can call into AI api's and we can also call into uh, ml services 
and, and so that, that was one of the things I wanted to, to cover really briefly is, and maybe we can just kind of go through a checklist here and say on um, AWS, they have um, Comprehend, uh, which is a web service Comprehend. They also have the, for NLP. And then they have also Recognition, which is a, a service that's available for computer vision. And then GCP has a service that does um, AutoML for computer vision. And then Azure has a bunch of these as well, but like Azure has, for example, um, the the computer vision and also has just general purpose uh, auto mail, right? And so these are all things that you can you can treat it like a component, right? So this is almost like we could call this like cloud components, and and, you, and these are the things you you would maybe want to bra bag sorry, grab from this bucket it is like each of these pieces probably you'd want. So you'd have the platform as a service, you'd have the DevOps components, which we already got into, you know, which is like, you know, code build or, 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 or code pipeline or, or whatever service uh, that you're using or GitHub actions. And then uh, maybe the other thing too, let's see, we have pretty much that's, and then we have, um, things like um, platform services. And so platform services would include things like the database, like uh, DynamoDB on AWS, which is a great DynamoDB, which is a great key value database. I, I've used it in production services and it's really simple to, to store data. Uh, or we have Cognito, which is, um, uh, a uh, great auth service, right? For for doing, you know, building things. So so I think this is a good way to think about, you know, if you are going to build things in the cloud with Python, especially for machine learning AI, you probably want to grab a piece from each of these four buckets. You want to have a like a either, you know, I guess it would be Pass, or, or IAS. With my recommendations focusing on Pass, right? The the I would, I would say maybe a little note, focus on pass, and then grab a little bucket from here, which is the AI APIs or ML service. Grab a little, another bucket here, which is, okay, where do I store it? Uh, maybe DynamoDB or, or RDS or wherever I wanna store it, and then grab an auth service, and then grab the automation DevOps. These are really the buckets that you can grab. To, to These are building blocks. Like These are like, you, you could think of it as like, meal prep if you're a chef and you're going to build a bunch of fancy meals for people you need to have all of these four ingredients in every meal right you have automation you have the high level service that that does it like the platform of service you have the platform services that allow you to persist data authenticate and then you have the ai pieces and with this you can build a ton of stuff very 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 quickly so let's let's get into a couple of those pieces here so the first one that i would recommend Let's start with AWS. Let's just keep it. Let's go in order here. So let's go to uh, console here. And what I like about AWS, the AI APIs, is this Comprehend service is, is pretty good. And I'll show you two ways to use it. So let's say that I wanted to um, go to Wikipedia and I want to find uh let's let's take a basketball player lebron james and i'm gonna i'm gonna grab his web page here and i'm gonna grab a bunch of text what i can do with a service like comprehend is i can say launch comprehend and i don't need to train a model or do anything i can just paste this in and, and it will do text analysis for me and, and this is very powerful because I, I don't have to, to do advanced NLP on my own. I can just leverage the AWS platform. And in this particular example here, you can see it extracts the entities, or I could even extract key phrases. 
right here. Like here's all the key phrases inside of this article, or I even could get sentiment, right? I could get, and this is slightly positive sentiment uh, for the article. Now that's pretty good because I can just cut and paste, but because we're programmers, let, let me show you how you would then implement this and, and use it in an application. Uh, in fact, it's pretty straightforward to use an application. I would start again with um, uh, Cloud9, and I think that's a great place to to build to build services. And if you use the Bodo API, you can easily tie this in. So I, I think I have maybe I've already built something here, so 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 I don't have to have new SSH keys. And for speed, I'm going to use this existing application. Let's go here. Okay, so I so I got this um, service here. I already have like an existing Flask application. Great. So so I'm gonna. I think I, I can even just borrow this to be fast and, and just say um, source tilde dot flask. Let's see. Hello ML. Been activated. Okay. So I have a virtual environment I'm going to use here, and, and I could uh, just say pip install IPython if I didn't install it already. And then from here, I could um, go through and just type in IPython and try it, see if I have Boto3 installed. So Boto3, okay, so Boto3 is not installed. Basically, what I can do is I can do all of this myself using the Boto3 API, the same thing I did in the console. So I would do the same thing. I would say pip install Boto3 and uh, go through here and uh, just, just try it out. And what's great about Boto3 is Boto3 is the central way to programmatically control every single thing that you need to in AWS. So every AWS service is available via Boto3. So I can say import Boto3, say comprehend is equal to Boto3 dot uh, Boto3 dot client and say comprehend. So all of them work pretty similar to this as you put the name of the service and, and, and I'll just show you the docs here. So if I go to um, Boto3, you can see that you can look at literally every single service on AWS. It's There's so many, it would take weeks to get through all these. Uh, but but for now, let's, let's keep it simple and keep moving here. As I say, comprehend like this, and, and I could say text, and I could just grab just to make it simple to not complicate the problem, let me just grab a little bit of this so I don't blow up my terminal like this. Put put LeBron James's info in here, triple quote it. And then I think I just need to say comprehend comprehend dot and I could do a dot and it'll show me all the methods that are available, which should be that either the same or more methods that are available from the console. And I can say, um, let's see, batch detect. Let's look at all the methods from S3 here. Let's let's go to comp. So you can just go to the, the service and look at the documentation. So you can go to comprehend, go here and say, um, Describe batch detect key phrases. What does that do? Detects the key phrases in a batch. No, so we don't want that batch of documents. We just want um, 
detect key phrases. We want detect key phrases. So we want to find the key phrases in this document. Um, so I'm going to use that method. Uh, and, and I could have found that as well from just doing a, the, the tab complete here. But we'll, we'll say um, detect uh, key phrases, and I'll put in text. I think that's all I need to do. Uh, it only accepts keyword arguments. And I could go back again to the documentation here and see that, okay, I, I need to put it in like that. I need to put text. So we'll do it again, and we'll say text equals text. There we go. And then we can say it also wants language code. So I can also grab that and say language code is equal to English. So go through here. All right, there we go. Now I, now I made an API call and it grabbed out the NBA text here. It grabbed out this. So hopefully what you can see here is that this is, this is a very small amount of code. This is just a few lines of code. Is I could just take that, throw that into a Flask app, put a route on top of it, and now I have a natural language processing API, right? So, so that, that's why I was mentioning this, this, this concept of, okay, these are the four ingredients, all interesting applications in the cloud. You're gonna have, you want the DevOps stuff, you want the PaaS stuff, you want the AI APIs or ML service, and you want the platform services. And so in this case, I, I did this, right? I, I did the comprehend, so I did NLP. Personally, I, like, I, I think it's easy to get caught up <clears throat> into doing too much detail, like with let's say natural language processing, where why are you doing this? If somebody is doing this better than you, why are you doing it? If you want to do it for fun, then be at least be uh, aware of the fact that you're doing it poorly for learning purposes. But if but if you want to solve something quickly, just go go do the shortest possible route. And and in some cases, it will be just pass this in, right? And so I think for projects, I think this is a fine approach: is go through build a Flask application that accepts some text, goes through and it builds this out and, and deploys it, right? And so similarly, let me just kind of hop around a little bit here. So that's the that's the GCP's um, in a NLP, but now, I'm sorry, AWS's NLP, but now let's hop over to GCP's NLP. So GCP, I, I can kind of take it to the next level here and say that you could build, um, and in fact, I have done this, you could use their cloud functions and build something that does some kind of NLP operation as well. So they have something called cloud functions here. And, and this could literally be an entire production system that you deploy. And what you do is you'd say create function. And uh, I could go through here and just say, you know, hello, serverless serverless 9 912 or something like that and then uh, make it make an endpoint so it'll give me this endpoint right here so i'm gonna i would build like a production web service that anybody in the world could use say save and say next and then i choose my runtime i would say probably python is the way to go here and then notice that it it tells you there's an entry point to this code and th all this means is that when the web service is called remotely it'll first invoke this function so if you want to build out slightly more complex things you can and then instead of here you would put in whatever packages you wanted to install but just just for simplicity's sake here um i will just click on deploy and, and let this thing deploy <clears throat> and so if i let this thing go and i go to hello serverless what will happen is that it will let me see the trigger. And this would be the trigger here, which again would be the web service. So, so I mean, this is actually fairly compelling because I don't have to do anything. Like I, all I do is put the logic of my application in here and I'm done. Um, and if I wanna test it, I can either trigger it via the URL or I also can trigger it by 
by manually passing in JSON payloads. And I'd have to look at the source to see what this, this does. And it says, if request and message. So I think I just say message in, inside of here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a test here and put in the word message. And, and hopefully this will work. Message uh, using serverless. Serverless, there we go. And I can test the function. Okay, right. So it just it repeats what's in the message here. And, and as well, um, I could call that payload by put, doing a post method. And so let me even show you how you would do this, uh, which is which is kind of a cool process. If I go, let's look at this trigger. If I go to this cloud shell. I can actually kind of invoke this thing and uh, let's see if I do history I think I have some weight you can call it even from the terminal as well yeah so for example let me let me show you this this is pretty neat as you can say Google Cloud function call and I would say, hello, serverless, 912. And then uh, I think it's, you just pass in the payload, which is like this, yeah, like that. There we go. And I just say message, which I think is message. And we just say, calling from shell call from shell and then put an input like that there you go right so this to me is the, the the most essential elements this is like a quick prep meal right you've got everything so but but i was talking about the the ai apis okay well let's do that right so how do how would i call an ai api in here i already built this i have an example here it, that's actually pretty pretty cool. So, in this example here, uh, I use this Wikipedia library, which does the same thing as this. All it does is call call this from Python, and then inside of here, what I do is I use Google's high level natural language processing um, uh, API. And in, in this particular case, there's a bunch of things that it can do. Um, entity extraction, sentiment analysis, all, all kinds of stuff. I'm just going to translate though, and I and I have a function here that just basically goes through and and accepts some text and translates it. That's all it does. Uh, now, I have a payload here that accepts the a request, a web request, and then I look for the word entity, which would be the the web page in Wikipedia to look up, the language, and then also the sentences like this. And what I can do is um, now take this code and call it to Wikipedia, translate it, and then call it and invoke it from uh, from the shell. Or, But first though, I think I'm gonna invoke this from the uh, console just to, to make it easy to do. So I'm gonna go back here. And in fact, I'll just put these in here so I don't forget. And I'll go back and say, to translate, translate Wikipedia. Let's test this out. So let's go to testing. And we, we know that it's going to accept a entity here. And it will it will take a language and it will take sentences. And sentences is how many sentences from, from what the Wikipedia page should take. So so we, we can just go to I don't know Google here. And um, we'll just do this. We'll go Google, and then we'll say language is English. Or no, actually, we'll, we'll say Spanish. We'll go to tra translate to Spanish, and then sentences would be one, or or let's let's do five. Let's do five sentences. And then if I test this, so if I make, make this go down here, I think I can, is this it? This should work. 
unless I'm screwing up the JavaScript, which I'm very good at screwing up. Oh, fail to parse the JSON. I mean, I always mess up JSON here. I'll just do JSON lint. Do JSON lint. So I think it's because what am I doing? Am I doing like, why am I screwing up? I always screw up the, the, the JSON. It, you know what I'll do is, let me look at the other function here. I always screw it up when I do it this way. I'm, I'm formatting the JSON incorrectly, but I, I did this one. I did hello serverless. And what did I type in here? I did testing and I was like, what did I say? Like message, hello, or something like that. And if I test that, does that work? Okay, so I'm just gonna type it in by hand. So I have some kind of typo or something like that. I was trying to get too complicated. So we'll go through here and we'll say um, entity is Google. And then I'll say the um, sentences is is one or sorry five and then language is spanish this e yes test it and it calls into wikipedia grabs the text pulls it out and translate it into spanish right so pretty pretty awesome that is an effectively an entire service that's that that could be you're done right that's the whole application that you're building and if i go back here to the shell again um which is hidden i can call that one as well so we know that that function is called um translate wikipedia translate wikipedia so i can do the same thing i can say gcloud functions call translate wikipedia and do dash dash data and uh, put in those same those same payloads right which would be um, for example sent um, entity this time maybe we'll do um, Amazon or something like that and then I could do the um, sentences and we'll do um, five and then we'll say uh, language and we'll do again the Spanish just to make it easy and then put the closing closing quotes and I can again call now this one there's lots of Amazon so let's let's do a simpler company let's just do um, How about uh, Facebook or something like that? And there we go. So we were able to translate from the Wikipedia page of Facebook just to see what it is. So, so I think, again, this goes into the, the, the power of um, why if you look at this com combining, basically we, we combine these two, these two alone is pretty much you know almost a, an entire application right here and, and then the only pieces missing are kind of the the little smaller pieces here to to really make it professional which is sure we would we would need to automate this right so that it's it's production or operationalized and then if we wanted to to use this for a real service probably would need some level of persistence to, to store some data in like, you know, a key value database, like in case of Google, it'd be BigQuery, and then also some kind of a, you know, auth, right, for for something like um, uh, Cognito. So th this might be a good check-in point. Does, does, is this hopefully like very clear why the AI APIs plus the pass, especially the serverless type passes are, are so effective?
and do, and does this make sense how you would how you would bring these into like a flask app and then or even you don't even need flask that's the other thing is that you may not even need flask so so in, in a nutshell this this is the this is the um the ai apis right so so I'll, I'll kind of stop there for a second now now let's get let's get into the the ml piece a little bit more like the ml platform yeah good sure um i'm wondering um that's um can we just uh, train the um ai uh, uh, i mean i mean the models in the aws with our own data because sometimes we'll have some the, uh, the downstream tasks so uh, we, we 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 just need to uh, uh, kind of uh, retrain the models um, with our own data sets because um, I think um, for example um, as an NLP I think sometimes uh, uh, if 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 I want to use um, for example uh, uh, train some uh, Chinese entity extractions maybe I I might use my own data sets instead mm -hmm. of uh, the you could yeah you, i mean you, you there's nothing there's nothing pre preventing you from it and, and so I, I would say more of like what i would what i would say is that you start with this and see does it work uh, and i think comprehend does work with um and, and also gcp or wh whatever cloud platform they they probably have access like if i go to comprehend here for example i believe it says supported languages that um it supports uh, German, English, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, French, Korean, Japanese, Korean, Hindi, Arabic, Chinese, both simplified and traditional. So, so you you probably could start with this, and, and even you can do uh, I think a custom as well. And so you also could say build your own models for custom classification. And so you could train a custom classifier to recognize classes that are of interest to you. Uh, so, so this is another interesting approach as well. So, for example, you could you could put in some documents that uh, you you could say, you know, these are comedy or drama, and give them the actual document itself and say, look, I want you to train this so that you understand that this is the kind of document I want you to classify. And uh, uh, now I just call the service to, to, to do it. Now, it, that's what I would, personally, that's what I would start with, with NLP. But also, there's nothing stopping you from training your own model using uh, Scikit-Learn or something like that, or using a high-level service like uh, Jensen, right? Or, 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 or some other... Um, some other natural language processing uh, API. So, so it just depends on on the speed and what you're trying to trying to do. Me personally, I would probably lean first. I would try cloud APIs because I want to get results very quickly and want to build the whole system and put it into production. Once it's in production, then you know I would I, I would maybe so, so that uh, one of the things that I like to think about is is make it is really this make it work component. And make it work very quickly so holistically I can see what's happening versus focusing on um, trying to make just one component very, very good. Later, once I got the work thing working and I, and I test out the full functionality, then I would probably think about, okay, is this really as good as I want or is it too expensive? I, you know, I'm calling the API all the time. I don't want to pay Amazon money to call because you do get charged a, a small fee. To call Amazon API, you're like eh, I don't want to, I don't want to call the API anymore. So so it's up to you. But but I, I think what's nice about it is you can get something running very very quickly first. Oh, okay, I see. Thanks. Professor. Sure. So the the that's that's the um some of these 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 AI APIs, and if we want to go a little bit lower again, the so so again for your for your projects, you could basically do something like this and, and you and you're, you're almost done right you could build build something like this put it into production now the other thing that that to be aware of though is that uh, let me let me get into the now the AI 
the auto ML a little bit more. So, so GCP also has um, uh, computer vision, which is probably one of the better computer vision capabilities that's out there right now for auto ML. And if you go to auto ML on GCP here, uh, and there's some quick labs that you can go through that do this as well. What's neat about this is you can click new data set and you can pick, for example, if I want to do single label classification, let's say I wanted to uh, always just pick one thing like, a, um, I don't know, cat or dog or whatever, and, and go through here. I, I can pick this. I could either upload an image from the computer or select a, a CSV file that points to a bunch of images I put in Google Cloud Storage. So this is they're, they're saying this exact example, right, is I would say I put in my bucket a JPEG file and it's a cat. And then here's my training data. And you have a bunch of training data and then you also have some test data. Once you do that, uh, it, will, it will store all the data for you and then it will give you something that looks like this. So if I go back, I think I have to delete some of these. I have so many of these that I created. Let me just delete that. Let me delete delete some of these old ones. So so if I go to this, this is something I did earlier, uh, and this is the images that are uploaded. And once I've uploaded these images, I can toggle between the filters, right? So so it's actually got a great interface for me to visualize all the data. And then if I click on train, what will happen is that I can train a new model and I have two choices. I can either host it in the cloud, which is completely fine if you want to do predictions and accept user input, or you also can do edge. And, and this is a class that I, that I teach on, on this. But basically what's, what's neat about edge, I'll show you both. In the edge example, you can see this, the model type is edge. If we go to test and use, you can actually um, download this model right here to a mobile device. So I can click on this and use, let's say, Android Quick Start and, and train it in, in the cloud by just literally clicking buttons and then downloading it and deploying it to, to this physical device here. And what's nice about this is that it's very, very low code and at the very end, you would be using the model that you trained and and, and uh, put it onto your onto your mobile device. So that's one of the advantages of something like AutoML. The the other option, which I had told you about, would be in the case of um, the cloud model. It would live in the cloud. Is if you say test and use, uh, you could actually call an endpoint. I'm not going to do it because it. It will spin up some servers, but it, but it'll serve it'll it'll serve up an endpoint, and then I could just have users put data into it, like handwriting samples or whatever. So this is another option, right? Is that you could try to just put MNIST data or some kind of computer vision data into the Cloud Vision API, click train. It'll be pretty quick, actually. Spin up an endpoint, and then tell Google App Engine to call into that endpoint and pass a payload and then you've got a complete end-to-end -end pipeline working for a computer vision application. So so does that one make make sense to, to everybody? Is there any any questions about this one? Yeah so can we mimic that in uh editor and say Yeah so if we go to let's go to let's go to um yeah so with with this one allows you to customize and train the model from scratch. It, so it's your own data, which is really awesome, right? Now, Azure has another service as well that does this called um, Cognitive Services something. I'll, I'll find it once I log in here. So Azure has, if we go here, It is cognitive services and cognitive services allows you to build a um, uh, to do to do to do computer vision automatically as well. So the um, cognitive services 
API. So Azure Computer Vision uh, is called Let's see. AutoML. So they have they have two they have just like Google does yeah custom vision that's it so it's called custom vision so so custom vision same thing it says uh, create a model in minutes so you would do the same thing you would do with Google Cloud and in fact I can just say here we can try this custom vision let me go back to this and say custom vision vision there we go and so you can you you basically can you know build out this thing uh, do do all your you know same thing upload your data for training uh, and then what it will do is it, it'll it'll be very similar to what we did on the Google Cloud is you can you can train your model I have to, I would have to set up a couple things to to get this to working but you can see look it looks very similar here right you you have images you tag and and then you go through you click train and then you do a you do a prediction so they they have that now uh aws doesn't have the upload your own computer vision images thing yet but they do have um recognition and with recognition you can just drag and drop images uh right so if i if i went through and i wanted to try objects and scene detection for example I could go to same thing like LeBron James, grab him, and uh, go back to the recognition, upload it, and this will give me back object detection, right? So, so we can see that this is you know humans person team sport right so it, it doesn't yet have the f complete um auto ml for computer vision i would bet they're going to get one very soon but they do have this where you can just upload things and, and obviously you can do this from the api so you could also and, and if you want to look at that i've actually got a bunch of code on that we probably don't have time to get into it today but the edge computer vision there's a ton of these examples here, but but inside you can also programmatically call like uh, like the 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 vision API. So you can say a Boto three, and then say call call this API. So yeah, Google and and Azure have upload the images, train it automatically, and then and then use it, download it. Um, and Google in particular is really good support for local mode the aws has great support for doing the you put the images inside of a bucket and you and you translate and you you do label detection uh, on on that particular bucket the um yeah so i think we've got what else what did we tackle here so we got we covered recognition we covered comprehend we covered gcp auto ml we also covered the translate i guess as well We'll just call that translate. And we covered serverless. Uh, Azure, we covered computer vision. So I guess, yeah, what what are, what other services, uh, high-level services are, are you interested in, in learning about? I mean, one, one thing I can show you, one thing I can show you that might be interesting is I was just working on this, maybe I think earlier today, was if we go to Azure here and I go to uh, Home and I go to Machine Learning, uh, one thing that we could do that's, that's kind of neat is that I can go to let me show you like an a, a workflow for computer vision that's pretty easy. So I'm gonna go to um, some NBA data that I have, and I'm gonna download this NBA data, which is here. 
and I think it would be, this is a good bit of data. So this is some NBA data that has players, uh, positions, that kind of stuff, and also um, three-pointers and salary and Wikipedia data, all kinds of fun stuff. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to this, and I'm going to download this. So yeah, Twitter recount, salary, all kinds of good stuff. So, so I'll, I'll go here and just say file, save as. And let's say I want to predict salary for an NBA player. What I could do is go to a machine learning workspace and then uh, launch this studio. And then go to this auto ML as well. So I'm going to click on start and then I'm going to do a new auto ML run. And if I click on the new auto ML run, uh, I'll show you the end result, which I did earlier, but I could say create result and say from local files, from data sets, from web files, from open data sets, but I'm going to say from local files here and I will say, uh, NBA, uh, salary, and it's going to be tabular data. And I'll just put the same thing, MBA salary. I'll go next, <clears throat> use existing uh, data storage, go to upload this tabular data, go ahead and say next. And once I say next here, I can say uh, use headers from the first uh, file. And then I could say next again, and this is a schema, right? These are all the different things that are in this file. If I say next, it's going to say, do you want to create this? Sure. I'll go ahead and create this. And now uh, if I go to NBA salary, one of the, we can kind of look at all the different statistics of this, which is, which is pretty cool. If, if I needed to, like each of the columns, it already generated all these descriptive statistics, which, which is actually pretty, pretty helpful. Um, shows me how many are missing. For example, if I wanted to, you know, see, you know, what, what are the missing count of things? Uh, and, and I guess if I go to salary here, which is one of the more interesting ones, Let's look at the salary in the MBA. So the distribution here uh, is that there's a lot of people not making more than 3 million. So 0.06 to 3, and there's a very, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, there, there are some people making, this was I think 2016, but there's people making 30 million. Same with page views, right? These are the Wikipedia page views. But the, the reason I was showing all this is I could select this and I could say uh, next, and I can say um, create a new experiment and say predict salary, like that. And I can select the target. I want to predict how much money people are making, right? Salary in millions. And I'm going to select this demo cluster. And then I could choose here, what is the kind of problem that I want to solve? Is it classification, right? This would be categorical, yes, no, blue, green. And, and do I want to do deep learning? And I'll, or is it regression? So in salary, it would be regression because it's a continuous numerical value or time series forecasting. Um, I'm going to go ahead and select regression and then say finish. And then it'll go through and it'll build this out. So this is yet another thing that you could do is you could you could um you could actually just spin one of these up, upload it manually, and then call via the Azure Python SDK and get the results and then put that into a Flask app, which I think is actually pretty interesting. Now let me show you. I ran this earlier. So I think I have this result here completed and Let's look at what happened. And we can see that um, that it went through and it ran a bunch of different models for me. And so inside of this model, uh, it was able to do 
a voting ensemble. So it picked a bunch of different types of models to try to predict who would be paid the most money. And uh, if we look at this explanation here, we can see that um, uh, it, it was able to, to come up with a pretty good um, result here. So if I go back again here, we look at the, the correlation uh, that view other metrics, we see that the R squared is 56%, which is pretty good. And here's our Spearman correlation, um, explained variance, mean absolute error is three. So, so basically, um, we, we, were, we were able to come up with a prediction here. And if I look at the explanation, what, what is it that explains the, um, what are the things that, that explain the most in the MBA, who gets paid what? And so what we can see is that the, um, it looks like free throws are, are the most important feature, which is non-intuitive, right? Uh, the second most important feature would be age and then minutes played, which I, I guess is somewhat intuitive. But but what's also interesting is look that uh, defensive rebounds and then also social media, right? So we can see that actually Twitter and Wikipedia are, are actually more important than field goals attempted, which is very surprising, right? That, uh, or two point uh, attempts. So we, we can see that somehow potentially even their their importance as 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 social media stars plays a role in, in in what they play and we can look at the absolute value as well and we can see that in fact the worse you are at free throws the less money you get paid which is actually very fascinating and then the more this is i mean massively important to the model and um if we look into this, we can see age is kind of equally distributed, both positively and negatively to the salary. And then the minutes played is kind of similar. And then also we can see that uh, page views and Wikipedia. So, but, so, so this might be an interesting thing. If I was the agent for an, an, an NBA player, I would say, hey, <laughs> you need to make your free throws. This is, this is one of the most important factors in getting paid you know, millions of dollars uh, per year. Uh, so then again, you can actually go down and, and use the, um, you can actually go to the, what is it? Um, if I go to Azure Python SDK here, uh, the, the, for um, Azure ML, you, you could easily call Flask from this and, and you could you could call into that endpoint and you could list the experiments, uh, and it, let's just look at the reference here. So you would, you would, um, if we get to this experiment right here, you could call into this experiment. And in fact, I could try that real quick. Let's see here. If we go back to, we know that this experiment is called NBA salary. So let's try that. Let's let's see real quick if I can be brave and uh, see if this works. Uh, so I will. It's, it's not that confident, but let's just see if I can really quickly programmatically call that experiment and and see how we could hook into it. So I would um, provision a cloud shell and um, look at history to find like a. Here we go, here's a virtual environment I have. And then uh, I would probably do maybe like a, either IPython or a script. Probably in this case, um, uh, IPython might work. And let's see what the API call wants. Yeah, we, we, we may not be able to, to do this, but let's see. So it needs a workspace object. Uh, so let's try this. Let's put this next to it. Go here. So you would say from Azure, import this. And then I also, I think you have to import the workspace object, which shows the space that I did this experiment in. 
So I think it's from Azure Core dot. Let's see, I might have one. Workspace from config. Wait, what is that? Let's see if we can get this working. I'll, br I'll briefly briefly try this, see if I've got something in, in memories here somewhere. I thought I did have a list, a workspace. That looks pretty good. So I just have to import the workspace. So I would say uh, from Azure Core, so from Azure ml.core. Workspace, import workspace. Hopefully it's like that. From Azure ML Core, import. Is it that? Okay, that looks like that worked. Okay, and then I can try this next line of code here, which was list experiments. Oh, experiment lot list. And so we see MBA salary here. So I can just do, um, we can just say um, that would be number, what would that be? It would be number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I could do that. I could say results is equal to that. Results is it seven. So the, because it starts at zero, that looks good. And so I would say uh, NBA here, and then NBA dot, uh, Maybe it would be list. Anyway, you could you could you could basically start. Um, you, you could you could start programmatically. I don't. I'd have to look at the API calls to to exactly get it right. But basically, you can take that same workspace, and 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 hook hook the the inputs into it and start doing other uh, API calls. So like you have those same variables and, and throw it in there and start building out your own uh, machine learning prediction. So I think this is also a, a very interesting process because you can see here, you can easily build your own uh, experiments. In fact, we could try one more experiment real quick. Have a little bit of time is, let, let's try one more. So if I if I take the same data and I go to AutoML, I could say new automated run, grab the same thing that I did earlier, which is this MBA data and go next, uh, create a new experiment, and we'll call this predict um, page views or something like that. And so can we, predict, can we predict who has the most page views? So like who's the most popular? And so I would say we wanna pick the page views right here. So we wanna target this, and we can look at this note here that says, this is what the model will be trained to predict. Same thing, pick this cluster, go next, and this would be, again, a regression. So we could do a bunch of different experiments here. So we got the um, page views one. Let's do another one as well. So I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do one more here. I'm gonna go to new run, go to the MBA data again, and let's do a categorical. So if I look at the, in fact, let's go look at this data set real quick. Let's see, are there categorical variables I could predict Let's see, maybe position. Yeah, that would be kind of cool. Is let's see if we could pick the kind of per, the position based on that. This is, would be actually very interesting. So we'll say a new experiment, and we say position, p position prediction, or something like that, like that. Go through here and go to position, and then as well, go to this demo cluster. Go next. This time we'll do actually. Um, classification and, and we could if we wanted to do deep learning but I think that this is better for for text data so we don't we don't need to do it in this particular one uh, and I'll say finish 
And so we'll see here. We, we have a couple of different um, ML models. So, so for me, as someone who I can do this myself from, from scratch uh, in Python, but why? Why would I do this if I can just build all this myself? And so let's see. This one's preparing. This one's running. So this will be interesting. Let's see how long this one takes to see if this one will be will be pretty quick. So I, I think I can just click on this. And again, what it will do is it will it will tell it a bunch of different um, uh, predictions here and, and give us give us what it thinks are, are the best models for predicting page views based on this data. So that that's super super high level, I think. Uh, we, we were able to maybe to wrap things up here is I think we were able to show that for modern machine learning in the cloud in particular, that think of these four ingredients, you're the master chef, and you just pick 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 a piece of have at least one of all of these. The DevOps, the pass infrastructure service, with my recommendation being pass, AI APIs or a high level service. And then a platform service as well. When you get to the point where you need to persist the data, use the platform service. Uh, 